everybody. <laughs> I'm Vivian Goldman. I do teach uh, at uh, Clive Davis Institute around the corner, and I'm very thrilled with Sukhdev, the creator of the colloquial. Hello, 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 very punk style. <laughs> For our popular culture, asked me to come and say a few words as one of the people in New York now who was a frequent denizen of the Four Aces. And uh, um, I have to say, I had to laugh when Don Letts was saying that stuff at the end because I did remember that I was one of those people that collapsed at the Four Aces. I remember very clearly <laughs> that moment when the floor comes up to meet you. But I have to say that being a reggae journalist, I was rescued that night by the legendary singer Dennis Brown, who took me home in a taxi and dropped me off and went back up to the club. Now, I mention this, really, uh, not to sh only to show you know, how weak heart I am or was in those <laughs> days, but also to say that the likes of Dennis Brown, like massive global legends and great geniuses of our time, were really knocking about in the four races. And uh, uh, somebody said something rather poignant in that film. New York had the Apollo. London had the four aces, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you know how people say CBGBs is like, was like a shithole? But if you compare CBGBs to the four aces, the four aces as we knocked about in it in those days, you know, um, CBGBs was the Apollo, because the four aces really was a vile, noxious <laughs> hole in the ground sort of thing. It really, really was, and those of us who were there, anybody who was at the four aces could raise their hands. Cosmo Vinyl. Anybody else? So I guess me and Cosmo are here to bear witness. Um, uh, but you remember it was a sort of fire yeah, trap and a toxic hazard. I mean, that would be a complete, as would be kind of almost expected. But yeah, it was just nothing. Um, I only have, only went there a couple of times, and never when it was really crowded midweek with you know other faces, but not not like at the peak peak because. Um, Knowing about it younger would have been too intimidating. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have known, you know, the period, kind of pre the punk rock period, when that kind of sound system thing really, really comes up in London. You start to notice, like, dreads, like, all over the place, you know, yes. loading in these wardrobes into places. Yes. You know, like, like, all these kids, kind of young teenagers, doing all the, the lifting, you know, and these guys all ringing about and just seeing all that. But way, there, there it is behind you, way too intimidating oh, to, to have actually gone inside at first. Uh, well, I'd say that before, when I knew I was doing this, I spoke to our, our reggae photographer friend, David Corio, who used to go down there in London. So, oh, we're doing this thing on the four aces. And he was like, oh, yeah, you used to go to the four aces if you could handle getting a shanking, because it's true. <laughs> a shanking means if you were going to be, like, stabbed. Um, because, but it was partly because it was such a small, tiny place. So any rivalries, as was the case with any Shabin, an underground dance place, any rivalries could possibly blow up there, right? But at the same time, there weren't guns. So it was never, ever really, really violent. People might just get vexed and knock each other out sort of thing. But it, 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 one of the things that it really made me think, seeing this film, was that there were all these incredible talents and visionaries knocking about in a tiny, tiny basement. People that would go on to change the world. And f uh, documentary lovers in this room, and several documentary makers that we have in this room, uh, will have noticed that as a regular documentary, it was all a bit weird, that film. Because it wasn't tailored to a regular transmission length for the BBC or a cinema. It's just a sort of rambling tribute covering, um, you know, covering several decades to uh, the incredible impact that culture can have literally bubbling up from a subterranean spring of creativity and, uh, 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 and flowering and going on to echo and resonate around the world from one absolute noxious fire trap dump and how there's no footage, there's like barely any footage in this documentary and we see that documentaries are generally, oh hello, uh, so, uh, um, they're generally built around footage. Now why is this? Obviously it was because, especially in the earlier era, it was a time 
when there was very little video equipment and the whole thing of filming and individual filming didn't really happen. Plus, the denizens of the aces were, you know, on a low economic rung normally and were less likely to have access to that very rare and, you know, expensive equipment. And it made me think about how different it is now when everybody they're buying those long leads so they can take selfies and they're chronicling everything and nothing is even happening unless they can put it on Facebook. With, you know, the experience they've had doesn't even exist. Meanwhile, huge cultural epochal things were happening in a, in a pestilent basement and there's, you know, no record of it at all, visually, barely, except for those few shots backstage in the room upstairs at the Four Aces. And I found those moments in the film really lovely. I don't know whether you did. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. where the people are knocking about in that little back room with the fake wood four mica walls. And, you know, it's a really mixed crowd, you know, men, women, black, white, really representative of East London at that time. Um, uh, that's the only little germ of visuals that we have that we see in the film, there's virtually nothing, because I recognise a lot of the footage, even the footage of Matumbi is not necessarily from the Four Aces, you know, but it, it, um, you know, it goes to show that um, where you have that sort of engine of energy, it is quite a distinct thing from today's obsession with chronicling every moment. Today, there are people are obsessed with chronicling every moment. What, what are they chronicling? Chronicling. What are they chronicling? Chronicling, chronicling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and some of the, it made me think that maybe people are so busy capturing nothing in particular. I wonder where that dynamic engine of energy is now when people were so oppressed and they couldn't go out in the street without getting beaten up and their only release was those moments at the Four Aces. And although that film isn't like edited in a tight way, really making its points, but you know, in a way maybe as it, as it could have, what it really does do is, it, it, is chronicle how crucial music is for resistance, how, as Ari put it very sweetly, our late friend Ari, from, um, from The Slips, and she talked about in there, you know, identity, culture, roots reggae. She wrapped it all up in a little package. I don't know whether any of you noticed how she said that. And again, it you know, makes, you th makes you think because um, now, which music really functions like that in a street way, calling to all classes up and down, you know? And you know, where now, say, in New York, or in Dalston, or in Ladbroke Grove, where myself and Jolly used to frequent Weasel's Shabin, uh, and I have to say that was, I was thinking of that joint uh, as I watched this film, because rather similar to the Four Aces, we used to rock out there, we used to drop a pound, go in there for a quid, go into another fire trap basement, incredible sound, used to buy a spliff and a nutriment and a red stripe, and, and, and of course a baby sham. Let's not forget a baby sham, my personal favourite. Um, you know, and that went on for years, sort of right behind the Portobello Road market. Until Vivian and Caroline Coon, what a pair of foxy <laughs> girls they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and that carried on until one day Weasel went in to open up the Shabin and the floor was gone. <laughs> because the owners had gone in there like, and they had chopped up the floor. And that was really the only way they could get the dancing to stop. And you know, it was felt the same way when you saw that they took the roof off the aces and that was the only way that they could sort of stop the dance. But it shows how you need that sort of cultural drive to give a sort of shape and a, and a sort of um, intent to each generation. 
And we managed to make it, and then the rave, you know, we managed to make it as the punky reggae generation. The Scar people before us managed to make it. Um, and then those rave people managed to make it into something else again. But it's so vital to have that little corner, that little noxious, pestilent basement where you can do what you want. Because although, you know, there was that element, maybe we'd get a shanking at, at the place, at the same time, there was an incredible, you get a sense of freedom if you're in some little dive that you're controlling yourself. And it's like, you know, young people and artists, you know, we need that space to make a culture that will create a unity within each generation of people as they come up. And it seems, you know, that film does show very well, you know, how as each, uh, as the music develops and the different generations come up, it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle because the fun that we get while dancing and listening to music is intrinsically perceived as subversive. And so, each time a, a, you know, a, a new cultural voice comes along, you know, as we saw with the rave people and the repetitive beats, they were uh, being attacked by the police just the same way that people had been before by the sus laws when they were playing reggae. I think what we deduce from all that is that really, like they say, la luta continua. It's really an endless fight, you know, for each new generation as it comes up to carve out their own space where they have some freedom to create their own generation and communities, culture, that a little space where they can, people can gather and get the strength that we really all want art for in the real, in the most real sense, you know. It's not all about the Kardashians and the reality shows, you know. That is a popular expression in a way, but it's not one that really progresses the debate or advances the course of how we can exist more freely, given the major constraints. One last thing, because I'm sure we're running out of time, right? But another thing that was poignant about that film was it was made just a few years ago in 09, and the things we've experienced even in, you know, in Europe and in America since then have shown how much harder it is to struggle to get that little space because increased surveillance, increased security, increased what they call terrorism and a sort of cultural schism spreading around the world um, that go further than colour, you know? that are to do with the mindset and attitude of people who feel very, very marginalized and want to tear down assist systems that have given them homes, okay? We all know what I'm talking about. New sorts of threats. The only way we can keep our vibe up and be ready to resist is to keep on creating our own spaces, keep on finding ways to uh, condense and articulate what we're trying to get through in in art, and you know it, that film wasn't really about the building the four aces. It was about the necessary continuity of culture as resistance, and how we we are going to keep facing this, these battles every time, but we have to have that sort of Bob Marley-like message, the last thing they played as they were closing down the aces was everything's going to be all right, don't worry about a thing. We've got to keep that sort of blithe spirit because we need that energy to keep creating our spaces, our own versions of the four aces. Thank you very much. Welcome to the floor. <laughs> Anybody got any vibes about the film or how they feel in uh, New York now? Uh, that's an odd thought. But yeah, I was, I was it would thing, be an odd thought, yeah. <laughs> I was reading a thing in the paper yesterday. <clears throat> it's about this girl in New Jersey who's in the shortlist to go to Mars as one of the people who are going to occupy Mars. And they said, you know, 
you know, she's never going to come back. She's never going to be able to come back. And they said, well, aren't you worried about that? She says, no, I, you know, I have my, my social networks. I'll be able to communicate with all my friends, so I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she doesn't need her four aces, because so these days we're so aces. isolated with our own isolation. And I, I was thinking about this on the way in here, and I was thinking, strangely enough, about one-night stands, and I was thinking, this would be, if you were hooked up, and you had a one-night stand, you got into a room with whoever it is you'd hooked up with, and there was no outside influence. There was no, she wasn't tweeting her friends, hey, I just <laughs> met this guy, and they're saying, what do you, you know, there was none of that going on, and so you had, like, it was a complete experience, and I think that's, that was the thing about when you went to a club like that. Once you were in there, you were in there, yeah. no matter what, you know, and that, yeah. was, that was what made it so good. And uh, I've always also said that promoters are the salt of the earth, you know, that mm. it's, it's not the, the, the room, but it's the people that curate. And that was what was, we're seeing with this gentleman here, with the gentleman that followed him, you know, that they were the ones, it's always, they start making, I've seen it before, like, there's a thing on City Gardens in New Jersey, and they started making a thing about the club, and they realized it was all about Randy, who was the guy who made the club. It's the people that's, that there are it's you mean as certain much as individuals who curate and make the thing happen. Yeah, so as much, as much as the actual, quote, talent, like a singer or actor or whatever, it's as much about the person who puts it all together and has the vision to see that assembled in a certain way, it can have real meaning and real draw to people. Yeah, the count suckles and the, you know, yeah. people yeah. Well, we have here maybe, oh, Sebastian can regale us. We have a noted Londoner with us and filmmaker and scene maker. Uh, oh, what did you think of that film? Oh, oh, Sebastian. I thought it was pretty incredible. You talk about the structure and uh, the edit. Mm. Um, you know, I was hooked from yeah. the beginning all the way through. Yeah. And even as it shifted through the years to... Yeah. You know the next generation, I, and I wasn't there then. Mm. Like I, I'd, le I'd left when Jungle just started. Yeah, I was here then, but I was, I was enthralled by the whole thing. Yeah, I, um, I think it's a really, really strong place. Yeah, and I think it just doesn't fit into like a BBC. I mean, it wasn't squashed into a BBC no, transmission no, no, it, box. No, it, it, it tells it, its own story. Yeah, it, it breathed really interestingly. Yeah. You know, um, not just the musicality, but like you know. Well, lots of you know really interesting documentaries about the scene that you know about or don't know about. I miss London a lot at this yeah. very moment. Yeah. You know, it was a time and a place. It's very unpretentious, isn't it? Yeah. You know, people are just they do it. That's what it was. Yeah. All that talent bubbling up. Anybody American here who might like to say how it strikes a resonance with them, and you know, I'd like to see it linked in to now. Where do people go now? You know, I used to live on the Lower East Side, down the road from here. We had loads of noxious dives we could do things in, but no longer. I mean, where do, you know, Ameri can an American speak? <laughs> I, I personally think, I mean, I, I relate to this a lot. Because I, I have, my name's Arthur Fournier. I'm a, um, a rare book dealer and an archivist, and I collect a lot of material just around underground cultures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I certainly know people in London um, you know, the name for it is, is familiar to me. I obviously was never there, but um, but I just think now there's such a transmission of this idea of like luxury and celebrity mm -hmm. and this kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm a famous legend in my own mind. Like everyone's a rock star somehow and like posing for the selfie that it really does detract. I mean, there's something different that I think maybe because, I don't know, I mean, I'm maybe a, just a half a generation or a generation younger, but, but standing in this kind of liminal place between growing up prior to social networks and kind of being an adult during the time of like internet and mm -hmm. self-promotion and kind of instant historicizing of every single thing that happens. Uh, I think, you know, in part that echo chamber maybe kills things a little bit. That's my experience because it, it just doesn't, the, the cycle is so much quicker. You know, the hype cycle is way too quick for something to be kind of organic and underground uh, for uh, any amount of time. Uh, and build up that meaning and that yeah. gravity and that pull, yeah. yeah. Um, Can yeah. you say your name? Yeah, yeah my name is Nikki. Um, yeah, I think that now we're kind of missing the 
kind of ending. Like, um, I don't think that we have an exciting time because of the way that we don't have these like one night stands where it ends. It's like you exchange your information and then like everybody has to know everybody and you give your name and then it's not something that's going to end. I don't know. It's it's like once you're there, you have to make friends who you're going to speak to again. Whereas like I feel like in four aces you could see meet people from around the world and then just never speak to them again and then it was just like one good night. That was super fun. <laughs> but like here it's like we all go to the same clubs with our friends because that's just the way it works now. So mm -hmm. it's like we have like our places that we go and we don't really have like that one big place where people come from all around to go, if that makes sense. So no community hub. No. Everything scattered. Yeah, it's well it's it's just different. It's like you have your like small group that you spend time with instead of having like a place. You a have community. People. So you say like it's not a wider community. Yeah, yeah, you don't get to meet more. You would think you would meet more people with like social media. Like but mine. It's kind of the opposite. Huh. I was just going to say, I mean, being an old geezer, um, <laughs> um, I'm father of two boys and uh, one twenty three and one eighteen, and. Um, and that, unless they're talking in terms of you know small groups, there's not much of a we, mm -hmm. you know. The we, that not there's like like not much of a community. They they have their friends, but there's no. Do you know movement, what I mean? No movement. No movement. Not, movement, movement, movement. Or not even the movement, but like, you know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody not long ago, as I'm prone to do from time to time, um, about the wretched Rod Stewart, who was once in a good group called the Faces. He managed to get their faces in there. <laughs> And um, I was talking about the we, and then I was thinking like, well, who's the fucking we? Do you know what I mean? You went with like two, but there was a feeling. Mm. There was somehow a feeling that it was part of a bigger thing. A scene. A scene. A community. A community, no, absolutely. But, but and I, I, I'm talking about even before something like punk rock, which, you know, was, it was very tribal. Was very left of centre for somebody like myself. I grew up East London, not Dalston, but, Grew up in East London, and um, you know there was no arty community whatsoever that I was aware of. You know, so so one one found it through things like this, as yeah. the guy says. You know, you learn your history and all these things records, but somehow there was still a sense of, of 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 a we. You know, I don't know if it was the generation. Genera I, I, mean, I can't define yeah. what it was, but even as a kid, before political content came in, or aware political yeah. content, if we say, you know, kind of like, you know, around the punk rock, the, the Rasta influence, you know, probably the Rasta influence first in reality, mm -hmm. you know, though, hearing those things and starting to think about those things. Mm -hmm. But even still before then, there seemed to be a sense of we, even if it was just clothes, Clothes and dancing. Try gave us some a subcultures. Mods, mods and rockers. Actually, we yeah, have. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not old enough to be a mod, so in that space, but there was still a, a we. Uh, we have a raised hand by our leader at the back. <laughs> no, I was curious about the chicken and rice, um, and, um, and also the house band, because, uh, you know, one of the ways in which, you know, these sort of stories often get a bit of sort of traction is who are the famous people? Who were, who were um, in that scene, or who, were, who whether it's Bob Dylan or some other. But it seems like um, it was really, really local, and it didn't really rest on necessarily huge bands or sort of famous performers um, as well. And so that, that question of sort of locality is, is quite interesting. You know, how do you create a kind of magic, or how do you tell sort of stories about the value of a sort of place when it's not necessarily even about it leading to anything sort of seismic or you know, if there was no prodigy to sort of kind of legitimate the, the, the rave, the sort of hardcore sort of period, it would, it would be much more challenging to say what, what was sort of, sort of value then late 80s, early 90s, even if it was just as, just as potent. You mean, are you looking at it like from the lens of right now? Because now they do rely on celebs to get traction for well, everything. But these were local celebs. The, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, there's Tip so many le celebrities in that film. Ghetto star. Right. Ghetto star, that expression is a. Uh, anybody here want to define that expression, ghetto star? Not him. Uh, 
No, when I was first started going to Jamaica a lot in the mid seventies, about that time that I used to go there, that was a very you know to the four aces. That was a very common expression, and what it really means is that even if you don't have the latest Clarks, you can be a get Clark shoes for them that don't know. You can be a get a star, and a get a star is what you can be if you're literally dressed in rags. But your vibe is so intense and your charisma is so intense that you are a really compelling personality that runs things in your area. Ghetto star. But of course, if you are a ghetto star, you do want to have a nice hat. But what I'm saying is divorcing it from what you can afford to buy. It's, di you know, it's divorcing, you know, force of humanity from you know, only wearing the, the poshest labels, you know. Well, one, one to, to, just watching the, the guy there with the nice brim under his, mm. you know, over his locks. And um, there was, a, there was a, a, a defiant sartorial culture, you know. These yeah. guys wore, you know, some of very expensive stuff, but Definitely. in the rebel fashion, you know, the suede cardigans, I can't remember the name. They were expensive, the gambit. Gabichi. 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 They were expensive, man. I yeah, still but you have one. Right, but I'm uh, saying I still have one. one. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, but it was kind of like in defiance. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like. It's really true. You, you d didn't want what? <coughs> so and so, so and so. Do you know what I mean? It's like, like yeah, you know, it's like, you know, Mick Jagger is lame. Do you know what I mean? Rod Stewart is lame. These people are lame. We have this. We're yes. in front of them. And it's true that they, the people us. were. Sorry, finish. No, I'm just saying, it elev we, we, had, we had our own system of elevation, or other people did, you know, sometimes you're observing other scenes and other styles, you know. But even, and even within London in the 70s, it, it used to be fairly, you know, there, there were different, different competing styles, you know. Of course. Competing styles. Especially in Not London. Not an overall style. Well, especially in England. Yeah, because America has a whole different aesthetic and a whole different approach and, you know. So yeah, that England was always very into having a subculture with a distinctive sartorial style. One, one more point. Okay. <laughs> hey, it used to be my feeling strongly, and I feel it less now, but what led the stuff wasn't the music, but it was the dance. And one important thing about this space is that it was a dance space, mm. and people went there and learnt dances. And it's a funny thing, you know, if you look at if you look at Ari from the Slits mm. later on, there's a very there's a great video of her in, in Germany playing with the Slits, and you can see them doing the Shaka the Shaka dance, Warrior which you saw style. briefly, the, you know the, the the wild Shaka dance, and and there was a thing where it happened in punk rock in around '78 where everybody kind of changed the way they danced, and it led you know and this two tone and everything came on, and it allowed you know it's and this has gone on, and I think that this is one of the but one of the things that's missing now is that by being in these spaces where people dance is where this kind of communication, this is something that you don't get from social media, you don't get it on the internet, you only get it from being in a room with other people moving to music. Exactly. And you know, I remember when somebody wrote in Vogue or Elle an article when Walkman came out, because she was a girlfriend of mine who wrote this article, and when the Walkman came out, which many of you can't imagine a world, the <laughs> Walkman, you know, but there hadn't been, you know, that many mobile <coughs> devices that people really walked around with with headphones. I mean, there were transistor radios, but it, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't really function like that. So this girl I knew wrote this article, and she described it as isolation devices, Walkman, mm -hmm. and how it was the start of people communicating in a different way, and it's true. Now people can just sit and make a whole record on their own in their bedroom, you know, and then the pressing, is, the necessity is not as pressing to get out and mingle directly F2F with other humans. That has been a bit devalued, hasn't it? Because people are used to dating online, finding everything online. You know, they don't have to go down to the four aces to pull, to pull a chick. They I, think, just look I think maybe devalued is the wrong word because mm. it's been monetized. I mean, like there's yeah. this insistence on the atomized individual as a consumer, you know, and that's how marketing works today too. That's why social media is so, so targeted, mm. is that that means that, you know, 
companies all around the world have very specific information about you and what you like, and so they can give you one picture of the world that conforms to your desires and what you're going to buy and what they can sell you. Yeah. Whereas, you know, before that, when you had pop culture, when you had pop media, you know, everyone was kind of like receiving the same set of signals and kind of like maybe pulling out or teasing out what they wanted to do that. And it, that's, I think that atomization is like yeah. maybe key. That fragment, you know, creating fragmentation. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe it behooves us all in this room. I just got a question. Were there club reviewers in the 70s? You know, now it's... it's you know, no, yeah, well, I, we reviewed things like, I, you know, I reviewed things in Harlesden and the Four Aces and Roxy Harlesden. It wasn't absolutely the only one, the Four Aces. But I, I suspect, much like I suspect um, first coming to New York in 77, uh, I su suspect like before that, you know, the rock, as a kid, the rock press is mainly what I look to, you know, the New Musical Express sounds, things like that. That's where I get like the, the lead of my information, you know. Um, that didn't really, uh, with the, until like Chris Blackwell really invested heavily with Bob Marley, um, you know, reggae didn't get, didn't get any coverage and, 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 and rhythm and blues rarely, rarely got covered. I think maybe a little bit more in a melody maker because they had a jazz history. But they didn't write much about like, you know, the temptations or interview Norman Whitfield or anything like that. And I'm I'm looking back now, but what I've seen of old American publications is pretty much the same. I mean Rolling Stone is a kind of a hippie-ish, whitish, overallish kind of thing. And I'm, I'm assuming you have to go to Jet or, or some musical alternative of that if you want to know about, you know, the kind of, the, 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 the black music of the time. Yeah. You know? I mean, there's just... A, a divide. So, so you wouldn't, wouldn't get much on the four aces unless it was somebody famous, correct? Or with a record out to, you know, like... What, you mean at the time, coverage of four aces? But the little places that did it, like me and Sounds or Penny... Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, but, but it was... It was you know, these were comparatively marginal publications anyway. Right, and then you had, like, Rock right. and Soul or whatever, whatever the... Blues and Soul. Blues and Soul, yeah, which so was a separate, whole separate world kind of thing. Yeah, so there was coverage, but in, like, roots areas or, like, marginal publications... You had to be in it to know about it. Mm -hmm. It was really... You know, specific. It's not like now where you could go on the internet and go yeah. to reggae club and a hundred things would come up. Yeah. You'd really have to know somebody who knew somebody who knew to take you there. Well, it's like Don said, he took. He uh, took uh, Strummer. <coughs> yeah, we, we all went. We all went. You know, uh, Chrissy Hyde, who was my roommate after being Don's roommate, so she got around everywhere. You it know, was a specific, very small group. It was a very small group of people who were into the groove at that time. Mm. I'm curious, really, to know what how it relates to now and how you people, you know, think it relates to now. What do you think? What do, how do you think it relates to now and the culture well, now, I'm, the creativity you know, and? Matthew Hicks, I run a art space in New York, but I just play the devil's advocate. I mean, is yeah. there a danger of fetishizing the past? And by doing that, romanticizing the past. Whereas my guess is that a 14 year old doesn't feel quite as alienated as we imagine they might. And the fact that they do have access to everything is actually better mm -hmm. than having access to nothing. So I grew up in a working class community in the north of England in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it was awful. Mm -hmm. It wasn't good. There was very little about it. It was great. Some amazing things came out of that. But I have a nagging feeling I'd rather be 14 now mm -hmm. than in 1978. Hmm. Maybe that's because you're in the north of England, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry. Sorry. Uh, but, I mean, but I love the north of England. I love the north of England, but it was certainly very heaven to be in the south of England. I grew up near Preston, but it doesn't add it. No. Uh, but, you know, it's... When I was, when I was 15, um, 1976 was the best year of my life. Right. <laughs> well, well, all I'm yeah. is devil's advocate. All I'm saying is that well, this happened. has become an yeah, industry, and that the, the yeah. fetishization of the recent past has become an industry in of itself. And you know, I'm of that age to find it compelling. I'm here. I wanted to see this. I, I you know, I lived in Hackney for a long time. I went past this place, never went in. And you know, obviously, even within this film, the nuance of the rave scene. Of, the Four Aces was very different from the rave scene in the West End, but I'm sure it frowned upon the kind of working class rave scene that was taking place at the Four right. Aces. But 
outside of all that, is this obsession we have with the recent past problematic? And is it, you know, the way that it's been captured by academia equally problematic? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing that I remember me and Don when we saw each other talking about was um, how it's become so emblematic of youth rebellion, the tropes of punk. And so, certainly, say, on the fashion side, we, we were saying it's really amazing that nothing much has stepped forward since then. But definitely, I know what you mean. There's an industry of packaging the past, but at the same time, it's good they made that film because, as you, as you can see, there was scarcely anything to package. So it was really good they captured what they could with people while they were still alive for future generations. You know, yeah, I think in New York, like all of the people around Ghetto Gothic and Good Bayard, which is now a very, you know, very particularly positioned fashion brand, in the last five years, that's been as substantially interesting as anything that took place in Manchester in the late 70s or anything that took place in London in the late 80s. And it's happening now in New York. It's just being made by 18 to 21 year olds who have a different history, a different narrative, a different origins. And it's equally compelling. Oh, that's what we like to hear. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I, I hope to see well, it. Well, Hope is, you know, probably the, the most highly regarded fashion label of the world now, but it, three years ago it didn't exist. Oh, who about, yeah, right, right. It came right. immediately out of the ghetto gothic parties. Yes. Which were organized around a musical aesthetic that didn't exist before. No, that's so true. That, you're right. That is a case recently of a scene developing a culture and an aesthetic and close to where for people. But, you know, I'm sure the like equivalent mine. people in Berlin listening to, you know, vocalist techno mm -hmm. feel empowered just in a way some of the people in this film felt empowered at different mm. points in their lives. Well, Louis, you raise a very interesting point. I'm sure we've got to wrap up in a second. But it's true because people like me were formed and inspired by the songs that were very militant and provocative intellectually in the lyrics. But there's a whole school of thought that says literally just the beat can be a vehicle for, you know, revolt. I personally like a combo of the two because I guess I'm a words person and those words of those, by those artists like Dr. Alamantado, the one we always quote, if you, you know, if you feel like you've got no reason for living, don't determine my life, you know. So, you know, I realise that just the beat alone can be a vehicle for, you know, progress or new ways of thinking. Personally, I like a combo. And one, one I, last one. How, just, how long have we I got? I was going to say, um, I don't know if it will work technically, but it might. Uh, <laughs> but after, after you know, after you've uh, spoken, we were oh. hoping to show. I think this is the first public airing. Maybe Dan can oh my God. retro, no, uh, retro right. mode, the uh -huh. video for Vivian's um, Laundrette from where is it? 1980, 1979, so 1981 or two. 81. So we could, if we get the technical work. Oh. Uh, Jolly, you, Jolly's never seen it. It's no, I've never seen it. You're going to just film the whole thing and put it online? No, no, don't, no, no, no I'm going to sit it. But I want to make my last point about, about the highlight something in the film. You saw Matumbi, Dennis Babel, talking about how they went to play and they couldn't play reggae because everybody played soul. And this is, this is a sort of little known fact that it was very frustrating in those days that you couldn't go and see reggae live because and the bands couldn't play live. I remember the first reggae show I went to was Max Romeo in 1968 when Wet Dream was, you know, was in was was in the top ten in England and they wouldn't even list it in the in the BBC charts because of the, the dubious content of the song. We, you know, I travelled and went to see Max Romeo and he did like Sam Cooke songs for like 90, you know, 75 percent of the set and then they just threw in like four reggae songs like that. Yeah. And this whole thing of you know when we started DPC. The, the rebel radio in England, you know, we had this big pushback from the local black community who said, you know, we don't, you know, we don't want to hear that stuff. We hear that stuff all the time. We want our media to be upmarket, polished, you know, yeah. that that kind of thing. So, you know, I think that I think that they played the Four Aces played an important role in giving a stage to bands like Black Slate and Matumbi and so on at that time which they didn't have somebody to play until punk came along and then they could start playing with the punk bands and things moved on from there but it was well just to just, just to, to sorry to yeah, interject yeah. once again i mean i remember growing up and um outside of the hits i mean you're talking about Desmond Decker or Matt Romeo 
You could, or tighten up volume two, Trojan compilations. You couldn't buy reggae records in the regular record store. They didn't really carry them. They had their own stores, or there were stores like in Forest Gate that had lots sold and they'd have a reggae. But a lot of, lot of places, you couldn't even, honestly, you couldn't get any, but very, very few. You might have been in West London, but lot, lot, I lived in Manor Park. There was a reggae record shop in Manor Park on a little strip by itself, kind of mysterious place that I started going into. And kind of down the street, there was a record shop. Do you know what I mean? Where you bought your hit records or your new LP or whatever, you know, the Who or the Stones or whatever. But that, that, that didn't have, that didn't have, say, do you know I mean? like Johnny Clark or, or, or things like that. You know, Tatsuki or anything like that. I never had a problem with my records. <laughs> <laughs> my problem was not enough money. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure we have to get out of this room, presumably. Yeah,